Hey everyone, welcome back to Nat Joe's Caffeinated Library. Today we're going to do two book reviews that are kind of shorter. Um, one, because I read them kind of a while ago and I don't remember a whole lot of the details <laughs> and I suck at being consistent. And two, because I'm going out of town tomorrow morning and I don't have a whole lot of time between getting the house ready and packing and stuff. So there's my um, excuses on why we're doing this this way. So the two books that we're going to be talking about today is um, The Quicksilver Court by Melissa Caruso. This is, these are both sequel books. So this is the sequel to uh, The Obsidian Tower, which I read last year and loved. And then the other one we're talking about is The Bone Shard Emperor, which is the sequel to The Bone Shard Daughter by Andrea Stewart that I also read last year and freaking loved. Both of those books I got from Caffeine and Legends book boxes. So I was really excited when I ended up loving them and now I'm reading the series. Both of these have a third that are planning on coming out and I think that will finish this the trilogy on both of them. Let's let's start with the Quicksilver Court. So this like I said was the sequel to The Obsidian Tower um, and I freaking loved this book. So Quick recap of the Obsidian Tower. I'm gonna to try not to be spoilery in case you guys do want to end up reading these. I don't want to. I don't want to accidentally spoil like four books worth. So the Obsidian Tower was, but it was about um, a girl named Rix who does. She she has magic, but it like her magic kills things, and so she can't touch anybody, and so she kind of lives in isolation, and she's the warden of the castle. Gloaming, Gloaming Gord, Gloaming, Gloaming Gord, Gloaming Gord, that has this like crazy obsidian tower in it that hides this big thing, like this big nasty evil that they don't really know what it is. Like it's their family responsibility to never let anyone open that door. So Quicksilver Court picks up with the ending of that. Um, the door gets opened. Ooh, how do I do this without spoiling the first one? Okay, there's just gonna be a little bit of spoilers for the first one, because I can't explain this one without explaining the first one. So the door gets open and um, demons come out. Uh, yeah, so the door blocks one of the hells, or just hell, I can't remember for sure, but it blocks hell and the, a bunch of demons in it. So it's like the demon of discord, demon of death, like the, the traditional seven, I think it is, demons. There's a list in the front, hold on. Yeah, so you've got um, the demon of hunger, discord, corruption, disaster, carnage, madness, despair, nightmare, and then death. So Quicksilver Court picks up at the end of Obsidian Tower when some of the demons have been released. Released. They are, their whole goal is to kind of like prevent war between the countries and get the demons back into the, the you know, bottle. In Obsidian Tower, Rix gets this little bracelet that nullifies her magic that allows her to have, you know, human relationships. And one of the things I loved about Quicksilver Court was her growth, learning how to just like be with people. Um, she has this little love interest that I'm here for so bad. And it's just adorable watching her try to maneuver the complexities of like, dating when for the past like 20 years she wasn't allowed to even be within like six feet of people because it would literally literally kill them um so i just like the humor in that i enjoyed and just the reality of watching her try to like be with people when when she still has this like ingrained like oh my god don't touch them because they're gonna die fear and severin's story also gets a lot of growth in this one you just kind of get to see him be his own man a lot in Obsidian Tower, you kind of, he, he both, they both have like pretty dark pasts. And so it's, it was just nice in this one to see both of those characters really grow. You see a lot of growth in all the characters. This is very much like a, like a group, group goes on adventure kind of thing that focuses on Ricks. But the author, Melissa Curso, does a really good job of, this is a very ensemble-y cast, which out, but she manages to make it not feel cumbersome like there's a lot of characters Rix has a whole little like group from the rookery that she like works with and so you get all of these characters 
backgrounds and you get their problems and you get to see their growth as they overcome all these problems. But this is still a story told by Ricks from Ricks's point of view about Ricks. But none of the secondary characters feel obsolete or useless or extra or cumbersome. So I really appreciated how she just manages to make all of these character interactions feel realistic. Like someone who has a big group of friends, this is how it feels like this is how it would go. So I really enjoyed that. Also, there is a twist at the end of this. Well, it's not even the end. It's like probably the the end of the beginning of the last act is when the twist happens. And I mean, I kind of saw it coming a little bit, but not like I was right, but I was also really wrong. And it was the twist was so I'm not going to tell you what it is because it is too good to ruin but it was so well executed and it was so good and it hits you right, she punches you right in the feels and then like twists it a little bit and then like, oh, it was just such a well executed plot twist that actually means a lot to the plot. Like it's not one of those twists that they did for like off factor or to like justify a third book or whatever. This was a plot twist that made everything make sense and you're just like, that like as like it, it takes like the reveal happens over a course of probably like two or two or three chapters and like the entire time you're just like like as you're slowly realizing what it means and what's happening and you're just like holy shit yeah well very amazing sequel i have no problems with this i couldn't find one thing that made me go but i wish because there wasn't a single thing i freaking loved this book i adored the first one the rhyme that is in the first book, the, the, hang on. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, booby. Oh, did you roll over and show me your belly? Oh. Sorry, had to play with my cat. Okay. The, <clears throat> like the rhyme that was on the first one. Guard the tower, ward the stone, find your answers written bone, keep your trust through wits or war, nothing must unseal the door. Like that just is like, like I read that and I'm like, I don't care what the rest of it's about. I'm going to read that because that was so cool. This book continues that level of that's so cool. And I just, I love this book so much. And I really, I really want to read because she has another series that's based in the same world, but I think several years, several hundred years before maybe it's the swords and fire series. I really want to read that series. Cause I enjoy, I enjoy the world she's built in this. But part of the reason I love these two so much is the demon aspect and that for obvious reasons is probably not going to be in the other series. So I don't know. I really, yeah, I don't know if whoever, if y'all have read the other series, the sword and fire by Melissa Caruso, Caruso, um, should I read it? Like, is it, is it similar enough in this that I would enjoy it? Or is it similar enough in this that I would be comparing it the entire time and being disappointed? Let me know, because I don't know. But highly recommend Obsidian Tower, the Quicksilver Court, A++ recommend. I can't find anything about it that made me dislike it or even give me pause. Great books. So the second book I want to talk about really quick is The Bone Shard Emperor by Andrea Stewart. This is the sequel to The Bone Shard Daughter, which is right there, there. This book, oh man, this one was weird. I had a little bit of a love-hate relationship with this book. I literally, the second this was available for pre-order, I pre-ordered it. So this book picks up right at the end of Bone Shard Daughter. She's successfully-ish taken the throne from her father. He's dead. She, for the most part, the populace are buying it. Um, there's a couple people who are on the up and up and they're able to put two and two together and realize there was a coup. Um, but for the most part, they don't really care because there's not a whole lot of loyalty to this family, right? So the whole story of this one is can Lynn keep her emperor together and keep her empire together? Um, keep her islands from sinking and figure out what the hell's going on because islands are sinking. So that's a that was a continued threat in the first one. One big island sank and it was this like long fear throughout the entire book of are more islands going to sink? Why are they sinking? Well, that, that becomes a thing in this one. <laughs> More islands sink in this one. So she's trying to, you know, get people to pledge loyalty to her, trying to get people to, you know, give her people for her army because she's, de she's destroyed all the constructs. She's gotten rid of all the constructs. And that was her big, like, see, I'm not my dad kind of thing. But nobody trusts 
them because nobody trusts this family. And then the like the conflict for the plot is that so her big secret that she's trying to keep while also doing all of this is that she's not her she's not the emperor's daughter she's a maid construct to try to replace his dead wife we don't want that to get out for obvious reasons and so when the, another construct with his dead wife's memories because the whole plot of the first book was that she didn't know she didn't have emory any memory past a certain point and that's because the memory transfer that her father was trying to do didn't work so she looked kind of like his wife but she didn't have any of her memories there was a failed construct that he didn't think worked that he shoves off to some far island that does have the memories of his wife and so that becomes a problem in this book so clearly the construct who is his wife wants the throne back because she's his wife she's the rightful emperor right so she starts raising a construct army to try to take the emperor back and that's the big conflict is can Lin get people who don't trust this family and don't want to actually be part of the emperor really to submit people to this army so that she can fight the construct army that's taking over all while islands are sinking i mean it was a very good book i did have a couple problems with it though and i don't know like i loved it but i loved the first one so much more part of the reason i loved the first one so much was the cool bone shard magic that really doesn't happen at all in this book for obvious reasons i mean she makes a big promise that she's not going to use bone shard magic she's not going to do it because using that magic means that she has to you know take shards of bone from people and then if she uses it it drains their life it's bad bone shard magic is bad but it was so freaking cool and it was like pretty pretty non-existent in this book for the most part except for you know the construct army so that was i mean i understand why it was absent it was just i felt it was sad because i really enjoyed that type of magic the other thing that really bugged me about this book the amount of different character povs which is so funny because i loved this book for how well the author integrated different characters so i didn't like this one <laughs> this one rather than just having a main character or a main two or three characters that it focuses on you have a whole chapters that are dedicated to pov shifts which is fine except that eight out of the ten characters i really didn't give two shits about there aren't really ten characters but it felt like that many i love jovis i could have jovis characters all day long i loved lynn she's the main character i want characters from her all day long um that's about it <laughs> don't we got character chapters for her mom what the hell is her name hang on i don't remember nisong nisong's her mom we got whole chapters with nisong and her building the army and i i feel like she was attempting to show the pov of the bad guy so that you could empathize with them a little bit but i didn't care <laughs> i didn't care about the bad guy enough to empathize with them i wanted to see how lynn was going to rectify the problem and then we had whole chapters of this pairing what were their names i don't remember because i really couldn't care about them at all falui i don't know if i'm saying that wrong i'm probably i'm probably butchering it but the governor lady of the one island and her wife person what the hell was her name no oh, romani romani and falui i'm probably screwing her name up but i don't know how else to say it the the like governor and her wife pairing that's on one of the islands that overthrew her father as well and took over i could not care about these characters less <laughs> um aside from one tiny little thing that happens at the end that might become relevant maybe i really don't care about them nothing happens with their storylines that could not be told in a more effective way with one of the main characters especially since some time is spent on that island with the main characters i just i don't know there was so much bouncing back and forth between characters that i couldn't care about at all that i feel like that was the one that was the one drawback of this is it, it's a little too many characters little too many characters a little bit too much time with non-relevant characters maybe they become relevant in the third book and this is just a giant setup book 
But even in the first book, I really didn't care about Falui and I really didn't care about Romani and the rebels that are on the island and I just don't care. So that was, that was one big drawback for me was just that there are a little bit too many POV shifts and there's too, it happens too often. Like Lynn and Jobus will be doing a thing. It'll be very important. And then we're off to an island I don't care about <laughs> for like three chapters. And then we're back to the, and then we like skip over a bunch of the cool stuff with Lynn. So I just, yeah, that was one of my drawbacks. And like, there was a couple, like Jovis's mom gets introduced for a little bit. And I could tell that the point of that character introduction was to allow Lynn a foil to see how lonely she is for Jovis to stop being a dick about it, basically, and realize that this poor girl has no, I no idea how to be with people and has no family and is extremely lonely and, her lonely. and his mom allowed for that foil to happen. But like she was just introduced in such like an abrupt way and then like just like exits st st stage left <laughs> with like no like it was just very weird and i felt like there was a more effective way to have done that possibly but i mean it didn't ruin it like his mom was hysterical she was like the stereotypical mom who just in, like forces herself upon your life and feeds you regardless of how you feel about it which i can i'm here for <laughs> like i loved his mom i just felt like she her character was a little wasted and could have been better utilized. But overall, even with all of my grumblings about the POV problems, I really did, I still really did enjoy this book. There's a couple um, twists that come at the end that were very, like I, I saw them coming a little bit more than I did with the Quicksilver Court. Like Quicksilver Court, you're just kind of like walking down the sidewalk, minding your own business, and then bam, this thing hits you inside of the face and you're like, what the hell? With Bone Shard Emperor, you're walking down the sidewalk and you kind of see it coming and you kind of like dodge to the left a little bit. Like it was still a very cool reveal once it's confirmed that that is actually what's happening, but it wasn't as like, uh, is it like the lead up was a little bit, it was a little kind of hand holdy for the lead up of the spoiler. Like I saw it coming a little bit more. The build up to it was a little too obvious so that when it was revealed, it was kind of like, ah, yeah, cool, cool. But it was still a very cool reveal. Like I'm very interested to see how this plays into the third book because things got interesting with the Alanga. The Alanga, the super secret people. For some reason, I thought they were huge. <laughs> so they're the people that were like, they fought a war against eons ago and destroyed everything. And like the, their fights amongst themselves caused mass destruction. And then the, the emperor, what is, what is their name? When the whatever their family name is, I don't remember what her family name is. The uh, hang on, the Sukai, the Sukai. So the Sukai family, the emperor, defeated them with their bone magic and sent them off and saved the emperor, and that's why he's the emperor. Um, so when you there's all these statues about them, and like the statues are huge, and maybe this is just a problem on my reading comprehension, but for some reason the size of their statues and the way they talked about the Alanga translated in my head that they were also like giants, and <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're just normal sized people. <laughs> I don't that was just a me thing. But when 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 the stuff starts to happen, I was like, what? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that was a whole side. Anyway, the so stuff happens with the Alanga. You realize that they're not sleeping like um people used to assume like people thought that they'd either been vanquished entirely or they were just like sleeping dormant um they're not that's not the case you realize and it's i don't want to tell you what it is because it'll spoil a bunch of stuff but it was very interesting and i do want to see how that progresses i just wish that the reveal had been a little bit more revealy and the less like she she definitely walks the readers to it which i guess is fine it doesn't not every reveal needs to be like a moment but i still loved the book i still highly recommend the series to anybody I can get within earshot <laughs> when people ask me what I made um my, I made my wife read this one and she's finally starting the first one of this one so it's working <laughs> but still a very good series very good book the world building is amazing so that was my short little recap review of the bone chart emperor and the quicksilver court both of them highly recommend both of them a plus plus books I think the the second one for the Quicksilver Court, I think, was just executed a little bit better than the Bone Shard Daughter. And I honestly think 
I think a lot of her problems could be rectified if she just tied the, the loose ends together a little bit better and did less POV shifts. I honestly think that would solve most of my hangups. But some authors just like to do a thousand POVs. Uh, but yeah, thanks for joining me. Oh, don't forget to check out my merch shop. I have a merch shop now and it feels really weird to like talk about it because it's like really tiny still, but I'm trying a merch shop. I have some mugs, I have a couple of stickers, some phone covers, and I just have a new tote that I just launched a couple days ago. So check that out. I'll link it below for those of you who care. Um, yeah, and I will see you guys on the next one. Oh, Bubba.